Welcome to the 65th A.W. Mellon Lectures in the Fine Arts. In this six-part lecture series entitled The Thief Who Stole My Heart, The Material Life of Chola Bronzes from South India, circa 855 to 1280, art historian Vidya Deheja discusses the work of artists of Chola, India, who created exceptional bronzes of the god Shiva, invoked as Thief Who Stole My Heart. Graceful, luminous sculptures of high copper content portrayed the deities as sensuous figures of sacred import. Every bronze is a portable image carried through temple and town to participate in celebrations that combine the sacred with the joyous atmosphere of carnival. In these lectures, Deheja discusses the images as tangible objects that interact in a concrete way with human activities and socio-economic practices. She asks questions of this body of material that have never been asked before, concerning the source of wealth that enabled the creation of bronzes, the origin of copper not available locally, the role of women patrons, the strategic position of the Chola Empire at the center of a flourishing ocean trade route between Aden and China, and the manner in which the Cholas covered the walls of their temples with thousands of inscriptions, converting them into public record offices. These sensuous portrayals of the divine gain their full meaning with critical study of information captured through a variety of lenses. In this fifth lecture, entitled Chola Obsession with Sri Lanka and the Silk Route of the Sea in the 11th and 12th centuries, originally delivered at the National Gallery of Art on May 1, 2016, Professor de Heja examines the bronze images of deities created in Buddhist Sri Lanka after it became a province of the Chola Empire. Artists there, accustomed to creating relatively sedate forms of the Buddha, were baffled by a dancing lord whose very essence was movement. The lecture also reviews the Chola expeditions to Southeast Asia in the context of the lucrative trade route between Aden and China. Welcome to the fifth in our series, The Thief Who Stole My Heart. Um, and the fifth, as you can see, is devoted to Sri Lanka and the Silk Route of the Sea. It's interesting that from very early times, the ports of South India and Sri Lanka offered safe and profitable harbors to traders making the lengthy sea voyage from the Middle East all the way to China and back. Two monsoons regulated traffic at these ports, the southwest monsoon from the Arabian Sea and the northeast monsoon from the Bay of Bengal. Arab dhows voyaging to China, docked in these harbors, they refitted their boats, they replenished their goods, they bartered and traded before proceeding. They were able to make the journey to China in one single season, but the timing and direction of the two monsoons was such that on the return journey, it became necessary to spend downtime of several months in one or other of these ports in order to sail successfully with the next round of monsoon winds. In the year 862, soon after the Cholas established themselves in the town of Tanjavur, an Arab Dao was on its way back from China, laden with Chinese ceramics that were in high demand in the Middle East. It was shipwrecked off the island of Belitung near Singapore the orange dot at the bottom right of the screen. A recent collaboration between the Sultanate of Oman and the government of Singapore led to the reconstruction of this modern replica of the Tao using materials similar to those of the original 9th century boat. Its planks were made of hardwoods, on this occasion from Africa, while coconut fiber from India was used to sew the planks together. Nails that characterized Chinese boat construction, the Chinese junks, were not used at all. Such sewn ships required an enormous amount of rope 
made from coconut fibers combined with creepers and barks of trees. And this modern replica used all of 74 miles of such cord. The view of the replica boat on the right was taken during its initial test in waters off the coast of Oman. From the 10th century, when the Cholas were on their way to becoming a major player on the scene, ships stopped making the entire lengthy voyage. Instead, goods from both the Persian Gulf and the Sung China came into the strategically located ports of Sri Lanka, South India, and Sumatra for transshipment to the other end of the route. Substantial taxes from ships passing through these ports provided a lucrative source of revenue that could be used to build temples, commission bronzes and jewelry, and sponsor temple festivals. For the Chola kings, control of the ports of Sri Lanka was a prize worth fighting for. It provided the opportunity to divert all ocean trade to their own major port of Nagapatnam. Additionally, as we saw last week, the obsession with pearls for jewelry to adorn sacred bronzes was another major incentive to control Sri Lanka and its pearl fisheries in the Gulf of Mannar. The Chola preoccupation with Sri Lanka is seen in the royal copper plate charters issued by each Chola monarch. These charters list the military activities of each ruler, the battles fought and won, and they almost always commence with Sri Lanka, the most highly coveted of possession. For a period of 70 years, from approximately 998 to 1070, the Cholas took over the northern parts of the Buddhist island of Sri Lanka and converted it into a province of the Chola Empire. Polonaruva became the capital of this province. Tamil merchant communities now settled on the island. They built Hindu temples and commissioned bronzes for festival worship, just as they did in the Kaveri Delta. No less than 15 Hindu temples were built at Polonaruva. Shiva Temple II, named after Rajaraja's queen, is built entirely of stone and carries Tamil inscriptions on the walls and base moldings. They record gifts to the temple from donors whose hometown was in the Chola country. A comparison with an early temple from the Kaveri Delta demonstrates its close similarities to mainland architecture. The queen's temple was surely the work of an architect brought for this specific purpose from the Kaveri Delta. He must also have built the temple named after Raja Raja at Mannar. And these two stone temples served as flagships, so to say, of the new administration. It's unfortunate that the Shiva temple named after Raja Raja is no longer standing but it's significant that it is located in coastal Mannar of pearl fisheries fame, rather than at the Chola capital of the newly captured island. Inscriptions on a few surviving stone slabs from this temple testify to ritual and festival practices familiar from the mainland. A headman from a town in Tamil Nadu sponsored the temple, and he made arrangements for late night worship, for the provision of sacred food three times a day, and for the celebration of a seven-day festival in the month of May-June. Another inscription speaks of a bronze of Shiva with the bull, to whom an official dedicated a twilight lamp. Apart from the two royal stone temples, all other temples at Polonaruva were built of brick and wood upon stone foundations, often with stone columns, like this ruined Shiva Temple 4. And you see here a conjectural restoration of the temple with wood and brick. Its considerable size, combined with the fact that the largest number of Hindu bronzes were found here, 
suggests that it was the center of Hindu activity in the new capital. One stone pillar carries Tamil notations on all four sides that record the name and hometown in the Kaveri Delta of four individuals, clearly donors to the temple. Most likely, they were Tamil merchants recently settled in Polonaruva, rather than mere visitors from mainland Cholanadu. The bronzes from this site are an intriguing group that pose challenging stylistic questions revolving around notions of borrowing and selective adaptation. Several bronzes are distinctive in style and noticeably different from what we see in the Kaveri Delta. These bronzes were clearly created in a local workshop whose wax modelers had varying success in coming to terms with an unfamiliar Hindu iconography. For over a thousand years, Sri Lanka had been an exclusively Buddhist island. Its artists were accustomed to modeling images of a seated or standing Buddha, two-armed, quiet and serene, wearing a simple monastic robe, but no ornaments of any type. All of a sudden, these sculptors were faced with the extraordinary concept of a god famed as a dancer, a god who wore exuberant ornaments, a god whose animated movement through dance was the essence of his imagery. Probably the new Tamil patrons provided the local artists with models in the form of small bronzes of personal devotion that they had brought with them. Perhaps they also presented them with a mini iconographic manual of drawings, although nothing of the type survives. This 11th century dancing Shiva on the left from Polonaruva stands just short of four feet high. And you see beside it an 11th century image from Rajaraja's Tanjavur temple of approximately the same size. While the Kaveri Delta bronze conveys a fluid sense of movement, the Sri Lankan example displays a certain hesitance, in fact, a sense of discomfort with the treatment of a four-armed deity who raises his leg high at the pelvic joint to stand poised in dance. The shoulders of the Sri Lankan dancing lord are excessively broad. And the sculptor's discomfort at having to add two additional arms is noticeably evident in his attachment of Shiva's left front arm. The outline of Shiva's proper left torso is also sharp, abrupt, and very exaggerated in its indentation while that left thigh moves up at a distinctly uncomfortable angle. Dancing Shiva's face, as well as his crown, are quite different and look alien to those accustomed to the Kaveri Delta mode of presentation. The distinctly awkward attachment of Dancing Shiva's front arms is evident even in a frontal view, but it's seen even more dramatically from the rear in a three-quarters view and it conveys the extent of the wax modeler's problem with an alien iconography. Another dancing Shiva, also from Temple 4, was created by a second wax modeler who seems to have studied Chola models more closely. At any rate, he gave Shiva a face that would be at home in the Kaveri Delta, and most everything gels the diadem, the treatment of the towering locks adorned with trumpet flower, crescent moon, and serpent, a ring in one ear, a dangling earring in the other. The matted locks that swing out with the movement of Shiva's dance are unusual, but accomplished in their treatment as tight braids, and river goddess Ganges reclines elegantly against them. There is a continuing problem with the width of Shiva's shoulders and the attachment of the second set of arms. And here too, the outline of Shiva's torso to his proper left is sharply indented, exaggeratedly so. A comparison with this more successful dancing Shiva 
on the right will make the point. Now, what do I mean by more successful? In this context, I mean an image closer to the more classic examples of dancing Shiva from the Chola heartland in the Kaveri Basin. In the image on the right, and we'll look at it in detail in a moment, everything works. The gently sloping shoulders, the positioning of the second set of arms, the smooth curve of the torso minus exaggeration, the angle at which the left thigh is raised in dance. And let me point out one more detail. Notice the scarf that hides, yes, actually hides, the joint of the two arms along prop Shiva's proper left. So small a detail, but one that was routine practice in Kaveri Delta dancing Shivas. A tiny point, but one missed by the two Sri Lankan artists responsible for the two large dancing Shivas created by two different Sri Lankan artists for Temple Four. But the sculptor of this image, now to the right, did not miss the detail. Now wait a minute, where is this image from? Well, this much smaller dancing Shiva also comes from Polonaruva and was found in the very same Shiva Temple Four as the other two dancing images. How do we explain this? Three possibilities, let's see which one you prefer. One, it's an image carried all the way from the Kaveri Delta by a merchant who did not wish to be parted from his beloved dancing Shiva. It's all of two feet high, extremely heavy, but it could have been done. Two, it's a, Ka a Kaveri Delta wax modeler traveled with Tamil merchants to Sri Lanka where he created the Dancing Lord in a workshop that welcomed his participation. Or three, it was created by an accomplished Sri Lankan wax modeler who studied very carefully the positioning of Shiva's body in the models to which he had access. He noticed the little trick of the scarf over the left shoulder to conceal the obvious joint of the two left arms the unknown Sri Lankan modeler, and I think that may indeed be the explanation, created an image that would challenge art historians of 2016, making us puzzle over the smooth sculptural quality of this particular dancing lord found at Polonaruva. Also from Temple Four comes this striking little bronze, a truly effective portrayal of the emaciated woman saint known as Mother of Karekal. Karekal, of course, being a Chola port town just north of Nagapatnam. She is one of the 63 saints of Shiva, and she lived in the sixth century, prior to those revered three we have encountered, child saint Sambandar, Upper, and Sundara. Her story is bizarre, it centers around the fact that this once beautiful young woman beseeched Shiva to take away the unnecessary weight of her body and to permit her forever to watch his wondrous dance as she played on her cymbals. And of course, a miraculous transformation is said to have occurred. In place of a young woman, there now stood this emaciated hag-like creature all skin and bones, with spinal column and rib cage clearly visible. A stone portrayal of the dancing lord at Emperor Rajendra's royal temple on the mainland carries a similarly powerful portrayal of the emaciated saint playing her cymbals. She's seated beneath Shiva's feet, where she is accompanied by Shiva's dwarfish attendants who are singing and playing various instruments. Her hair is in wild disarray around her head, and her depleted breasts swing out wildly. The Sri Lankan bronze is so close to the portrayal on Rajendra's temple that it's difficult to avoid the conclusion that it was the work of an artist familiar with mainland imagery. Why so wild a portrayal, both in Sri Lanka and in Rajendra's mainland temple? 
the inspiration, the artist's inspiration, probably lies in the poems that the woman saint wrote on dancing Shiva, in which she portrayed herself as the ghoul of Karekal with incandescent teeth and mouth. Both images in stone and bronze capture the essence of the saint's own poetic portrayal of her ghoulish self. How about Sri Lankan bronzes of Uma? This image, standing over three feet tall, reveals the sculptor's misunderstanding of yet another aspect of Kaveri Basin imagery, the typical, the typical triple bent contrapposto. Uma's crowned head and lower limbs should be posed at the same angle, while the torso should move at the opposite angle. But this artist appears to have been baffled by this. Uma's head and torso are at more or less the same angle. For the viewer standing in front of the image, they both slope to the left, while the lower body is more or less straight. The result is an uncoordinated effect that is clearly evident through comparison with the Kaveri Delta image. But it's even more intriguing to compare the Polonaruva Uma on the left that we've been looking at with another Sri Lankan Uma in which the sculptor understood the triple bent posture and created an image that is more appropriately balanced. Images of Uma are to be found in both these categories, raising similar questions to those we saw with dancing Shiva, issues revolving around a selective, a successful ad adoption, adaptation, or a not so successful. And yet, both types of bronzes appear to have been welcomed by the patrons and donors of Shiva Temple 4. Was it a case of beggars can't be choosers, a sort of make the best of what's available type of attitude? Another Sri Lankan stylistic idiosyncrasy that we see in image after image, including the Uma to the left, is a predilection for overly broad and totally level shoulders. We see it also in this bronze of Saint Chandesha, standing about 30 inches high. His totally straight shoulders create a taut effect. There's also a problem of balance inherent in the image being posed stiffly on both feet. Many Sri Lankan images, even those with fully finished pedestals like this, seem to list forward slightly as if a mere touch might make them fall forward. A second image of Chandesha is quite different in treatment and more closely resembles images from the mainland. Her sloping shoulders, typical crown, the relaxed stance of his legs, the treatment of the face itself, all speak of the hand of the sculptor who is familiar with Kaveri Basin imagery. Time for only one more image from Polonaruva. This time, a seated group of Shiva with Uma and child Skanda. Shiva and his consort reside today in two different museums, but you see them reunited in the image to the upper right, taken during a special exhibition of Sri Lankan bronzes. And to the lower right is an image of parallel iconography from the Kaveri Delta. This bronze is a superb example of Sri Lankan workmanship. Challenging as the subject must have been for the wax modeler, he created features that would meet with the approval of his patron, who must have been a Tamil merchant living in or around Polonaruva. Shiva's tall crowning locks held back with the diadem accurately feature the trumpet flower, the snake, the crescent moon, the central skull. Shiva's third eye is featured on his forehead. He wears a ring in one ear and a dangling earring in the other and holds antelope and battle axe in his two rear hands. Necklaces, armlets, sacred thread, waistband, dhoti, anklets are appropriately depicted. And yet, the image comes undoubtedly from the hands of a Sri Lankan artist. The width and the straightness of the shoulders, 
the somewhat tubular handling of the limbs, the pronounced curve of the lower eye socket that is never seen in Kaveri Basin images are among features that are giveaways. Gifted Sri Lankan artists selectively embraced a set of features typical of Chola bronzes, and he adapted them to create a masterful image of Shiva, but one that reveals its creator's Sri Lankan origins. I would be amiss if I didn't point out that the Tamil expatriate community in Sri Lanka also supported Buddhist temples. This circular Buddhist temple at Polanarua, known as Avatarage, carries a Tamil inscription dating to the reign of Rajendra that speaks of a gift of a lamp, of ghee, and 30 cows. An even more interesting Tamil record dates from soon after the year 1070, when the Sri Lankan ruler Vijayabahu expelled the Cholas and recaptured Sri Lanka. The Sri Lankan king signed a contract for the security of his royal Buddhist monastery. And with whom did he sign this contract? with the Tamil mercenary troops of, a, of certain Tamil merchant guilds. The importance for the Cholas of revenue culled from control of trading ports can scarcely be overstated. And to demonstrate this, may I transport you across the Bay of Bengal to Sumatra, the westernmost of the many islands of Indonesia, and also back in time to May 1088. In the commercial port of Velapura, on the northwestern coast of Sumatra, a port controlled by a Tamil expatriate merchant community, the leader of the powerful merchant guild named the 500 of the Thousand Directions, Ayrati Ainutruvar, watches in satisfaction as a tug edges a heavily laden ship out of the harbor. He has just concluded a profitable deal with an influential mercantile group that wishes to use the facilities of their port on their way to China. He had negotiated skillfully, and they had agreed to his demands. In future, the captain and the crew of their cargo ships will pay handsome fees in gold to enter Velapura. Stonemasons were already fashioning an octagonal column on which the agreement would soon be engraved in Tamil, the language of members of the 500 of the Thousand Directions. How did this Tamil merchant guild find itself in so comfortable a position? on the west coast of the island of Sumatra that was largely under the control of the kingdom of Srivijaya. We've just seen from the Sri Lankan inscription that the major merchant guilds had their own mercenary troops to protect them and to safeguard their valuable cargoes. But we need to go back 100 years to 987, two years after Rajaraja became king to appreciate the complexities of the ocean trade scenario. In 987, Sung China dispatched four missions to foreign countries with the promise of special facilities and import licenses if their merchants would come more frequently to Chinese ports. China exported fine ceramics and silks and imported a range of goods, including Arabian frankincense, sandalwood from the Indonesian islands, and black pepper and cloves that were acquired from across the region, including India and Sri Lanka, and resold by traders at Srivijayan ports at several fold profit. Tribute from Srivijaya to China included large quantities of these much sought after items, and tribute bearers were given preferential tax rates at Guangzhou and other Chinese ports. When the Cholas showed interest in entering this controlled trading network, and they would have been fools not to tap into this lucrative source of revenue, 
Srivijaya attempted to keep them out. In fact, a Chinese document indicates that Srivijaya intentionally misled the Sung court by suggesting that the Cholas were mere vassals of Srivijaya. A vassal status would mean that the Cholas would be assigned a lower level of trading rights at Chinese ports. At the heart of this power play lay the topographical fact that access to the South China Sea was restricted. It was either via the narrow 50 mile long straits of Malacca over here or the tiny Sunda Straits. And both were in the hands of the Srivijayan kings of Sumatra, who also controlled Kadaram in peninsular Malaysia. In light of this tricky relationship, let's review, reconsider a Buddhist monastery built by the Srivijayan ruler at the Chola port of Nagapatnam around the year 1006. And by the way, it's telling that at the very same time, the Srivijayans also built a Buddhist temple in China for the emperor's long life, naming it 10,000 Years of Blessings. An inscription of Raja Raja tells us that in 1006, he made a gift of a village to the Buddhist Vihara built by the Srivijaya king. Presumably, this was due to a pragmatic desire to maintain a peaceful relationship with rulers who controlled access to the South China Sea. Srivijaya made several gifts to the Shiva temple at Nagapatnam during the reign of Rajaraja's son, Rajendra. Clearly, they wished to keep the Chola rulers quiet, content. In 1015, an agent of the Srivijaya king presented a number of lamps to a Shiva temple he erected a gateway along its compound wall. In the same year, he made a second gift of precious stones. For what purpose? To ornament a silver image of Shiva as victor of three forts. And four years later, another Chinese agent, and I'm sorry, another Sri Vijayan agent, an agent in fact of the king of Kidara, made a gift of Chinese gold to the temple to be used for the worship of a bronze image of Shiva as half woman that he himself, the agent, had established in the temple. In the year 1023, the Sung emperor issued a second proclamation in which he urged Arab envoys to shift their trade from the overland Silk Route across Central Asia to the Silk Route via the oceans. Soon thereafter, the relationship between the Cholas and Srivijaya went sharply downhill. In 1025, Rajendra undertook naval campaigns against Srivijaya and Kadara. The motivation for these campaigns was not territorial acquisition. It was far beyond their minds. Rather, the campaigns were aimed at loosening Srivijaya's dominating hold over sea trade routes with the hope that the Cholas might assume a more active role in the sea silk route to China. But Srivijaya was a literal power with long experience with the forces of the ocean. What do we know about the Chola naval engagement with them? Only what we read in an inscription of the year 1027, inscribed on the wall of the great temple at Tanjavu. It first recounts Rajendra's victorious campaigns within India that culminated with his march to the river Ganges, the sacred river of the north. It then turns to his naval expedition in which he defeated the king of Kadaram, having sent many ships in the midst of rolling seas. The very first conquest, you notice, is Srivijaya, overflowing with large heaps of treasures and its war gate, its jewel gate, its gate of large jewels. And scroll down to number 11, the very last is Kadaram, a fierce strength which was protected by the deep sea. Rajendra's campaign appears to have been little more than a raid with temporary success. 
50 years on in 1070, an inscription refers to the then Chola king as he who conquered Kadaram. Clearly, international holdings were very fluid. They changed with the fortunes and ambitions of individual Chola rulers, who each one they repeatedly attempted to become players of consequence along the Silk Route of the Sea, and they never succeeded. The focus of trading activities was not all in the direction of China via Southeast Asia. The Cairo Geniza contains, Cairo right up there, contains letters from Jewish traders in Aden and their counterparts living in the town of Mangalore along the west coast of India that indicate that copper items produced in South India were valued in Aden. Merchants sent raw copper to India, and the finished goods were shipped back to Aden. Consider the request in this letter, written around the year 1135 by Joseph ben Abraham, a Jewish client in Aden, to Abraham ben Yeju, who ran a bronze factory in Mangalore. He writes that he has sent to Mangalore a bag containing copper, total weight 53 and a half pounds. What does he ask for? A 10-cornered tray, a table jug, a small candlestick. And notice how the letter ends. As to the remainder of the copper, please sell it, and with its proceeds, pay the craftsman's fee. With the balance, buy for me, your servant, a small quantity of fresh betel nuts, or if they are not available, cardamom or turmeric. You may be wondering why we have spent so much time far from the Chola heartland of the Kaveri Basin. In part, because I believe that the political relationship of the Cholas with Sri Rivjaya appears to have influenced, to a degree, the choice of devotional imagery in the temples. Certain manifestations of Shiva appear to acquire great power at certain moments in time. Do I have a modern equivalent for you? Maybe I do. As I've been driving back each week from Washington to New York after these lectures, I see along a clear stretch of road in Childs, Maryland, a highly visible image of Our Lady of the Highway. This manifestation of Our Lady became important at a particular point in time when local circumstances so dictated. And I kept pondering over the special relevance of this as perhaps an example that I might present to you. But let's return now to the Chola heartland, to the Kaveri Delta. When Raja Raja II came to the throne in 1146, the relationship between the Chola monarchs and Sri Vijaya was at best distrustful, more likely openly hostile. Raja Raja assumed a series of martial titles, flow of heroism, sunrise of heroism, lion of the Cholas, pride of kingship. It appears that he may have harbored an ambition to reestablish a foothold in the ports of the Kadaram region fully aware that a Chola presence there would be downright offensive. It was perhaps this intent, combined with the degree of chutzpah, that led to the commission of striking bronze tableau of the eight heroic forms of Shiva at this particular moment in time, like this image to the left. Early in the 12th century, eight individual temples along the extended coastal belt each commissioned one of Shiva's eight heroic forms. These forms were celebrated from early times in the hymns of the saints. They were eight manifestations that Shiva assumed to defeat powerful demonic forces. But the appearance of eight dynamic bronzes, one in each of eight newly built 12th century temples, reflects a level of controlled planning not seen previously. It suggests, perhaps, a royal decision to project these bronzes of heroic Shiva, 
victorious and heroic Shiva, as exemplary dynastic prototypes prior to venturing, or rather re-venturing into exceedingly troubled waters. In a coastal temple at Varuvur, Shiva's triumphant dance is partly obscured today by the brilliant silks and sparkling jewels that adorn him. The archival photograph present, permits a clearer view of the image. Shiva is poised in a dramatic yogic twist, with one foot planted firmly on the head of the elephant demon he has defeated and skinned, and the other foot raised in joyful triumph. The flayed elephant skin appears as a backdrop behind Shiva, who turns in jubilant movement to display his effortless prowess. In his eight hands, Shiva holds a variety of weapons, including a sword, a shield, cleavers, trident, trident, as well as a skull bowl and a serpent. And notice the elephant's tail above Shiva's head and its two hind legs along Shiva's outstretched hands that hold the cleavers. Two of Shiva's dwarfish minions stand on the pedestal on either side of the elephant head. With the clash of cymbals and the beat of drums, they provide the musical accompaniment for Shiva's triumphant dance. Standing serenely beside Shiva is his consort Uma, with infant Skanda held against her hip. The subtle angle of her feet clues us into the fact that she's moving away in fear of the battle. Meanwhile, Skanda, who is intently watching the fierce encounter, leans towards his victorious father and points at him with outstretched hand. This processional group is the work of a 12th century artist who hesitated not the slightest in modeling a wax image with such exaggerated torsion. Shiva is close to four feet tall, with accompanying Uma around three feet in height. Cast in the direct lost wax process, they are solid images like all Chola bronzes. And one may estimate that the Shiva image, together with its base and lower pedestal, weighs around 250 pounds, while Uma and child probably weigh in the vicinity of 100 pounds. In order to stabilize this weighty image and facilitate carrying it in procession, the bronze casters provided two large sets of lugs on either side of the elephant head to contain rods to secure the bronze to its pedestal. Smaller lugs are provided between the feet of the dwarf musicians to hold them securely in place. This modern brass repousse fronting blocks our view of the rectangular pedestals of both Shiva and Uma. Two massive slots are intended to hold large poles that would be threaded through them, and two smaller slots lower down firmly secure the bronze during processions. Compare the bronze with a stone rendering of the same theme from Rajaraja II's newly built royal temple at Darasaram, 25 miles away. Cut in deep relief into a granite slab, the stone image portrays Shiva dancing with a torsion similar to that of the bronze as he holds aloft the skin of the elephant demon. In both bronze and stone, Shiva twists effortlessly and presents the onlooker with a view of his behind as well as a frontal view of his torso. In both bronze and stone versions, we see smoothly rounded tight buttocks. In both, the sculptor emphasized the softly curved insole of Shiva's raised foot. The importance of this raised foot is highlighted in the temple bronze by the addition of a diamond studded foot cover. Priests remove this cover to permit favored devotees to glimpse the perfection of Shiva's foot. It is the curved insole of Shiva's raised foot, known as Kunchitangri, that confers grace on the devotee. And indeed, it does exactly that in Shiva's manifestation as the expert dancer. 
A second heroic bronze from this group of eight depicts Shiva destroying Yama, god of death, and is in worship in the temple some 14 miles away. Throngs of devotees gather to worship the image that I was not permitted to photograph. This somewhat blurred image was taken by a bronze craftsman called in to repair some slight damage to the aureole that surrounds the image. The piece is roughly the same size as the Varuur bronze and depicts four-armed Shiva holding noose and battle axe in two rear hands and accompanied as usual by bronze of Uma not seen in this view. Shiva stands with his left leg raised slightly off the ground after having kicked the arrogant god of death, Yama, who lies senseless at his feet. On the pedestal to Shiva's right is his devout teenage devotee, Markandeya. It was to save him from death that Shiva assumed this manifestation. The eight temples to heroic Shiva are marked by yellow stars and they are located along the coastal belt in close proximity, more or less, to each other. It's a sharp disappointment to discover that the remaining six temples contain later bronze replacements of post-Chola date. The mystery of those missing bronzes is a topic we will finally explore in our last meeting next Sunday. Raja Raja II followed the example of his ancestors, Raja Raja I and Rajendra, and built his own monumental royal temple at a site with no sacred ancestry and with connections to him alone. The practice of commissioning images of all 63 of the saints of Shiva may have commenced during his reign. At any rate, his temple at Dharasiram is the very first to carry a complete series of relief carvings of every one of the 63 saints of Shiva. They occupy a narrow band that runs around the entire temple between those prominent wall niches that carry images of deities and the uppermost level of the base moldings. They are little vignettes, like this one, that gives us two episodes from the story of Saint Naminandi. His piety was so strong that Shiva ordained that the water that the saint collected from the temple tank, he couldn't afford to buy oil, and poured into the temple lamps would indeed burn as if they were ghee. Raja Raja's special interest in saints was also perhaps due to his father having commissioned the court poet to write the stories of the lives of the saints. That resulting work, known as the Great Ancient Text, was added to the Tamil sacred canon as its last and final book. Rajaraja II also sponsored the creation of bronze saints, of which a few have emerged during excavation and clearance of the temple grounds. One such is this threesome bronze composition, cast to stand together on a single pedestal. It portrays the lesser known saint, Shirutondar, his wife, and their infant son, Shirala, who was resurrected by God Shiva after an extraordinary sacrifice. Wearing a short dhoti, Shirutondar stands bare-chested with two strings of beads around his neck and simple beaded armlets and wristbands. His hair is pulled into a top knot, while his palms joined together in the gesture of adoration enclose an offering of blossoms to Shiva. To his proper right stands his elegant and elaborately adorned wife. Ringlet curls frame her face, her hair is swept into an elaborate chignon adorned with a band of flowers. With her left hand, she reaches out to grasp the arm of their infant son, Shirala. The story of the saint is dramatic. Shades of Abraham and Isaac, though much more gory. Bas-relief renderings on the walls of a few temples provide the entire bizarre story, but this bronze reflects the happily reunited family. Among the finest of 12th century bronzes are a group of images commissioned for a temple in coastal Valampuram a mere five miles from the famed Thiruvangadu temple, 
whose master sculptor was our focus last week. Vallampuram's group of 12th century bronzes testify to the continuing impeccable standard maintained by the artists of that exceptional workshop, who were surely responsible also for these images. This temple itself at Vallampuram was built at the start of the 12th century. And in the year 1126, a chieftain set up a bronze of dancing Shiva and gave land to the temple to ensure its regular worship. The broad, rounded face of the dancing lord is indicative of a 12th century date. So too is the very fact of the addition of figures along the base. In this case, Shiva's dwarfish attendants who provide musical accompaniment for Shiva's dance. And you can just compare the similarity in the placement and treatment of the figures along the base with those we saw in the heroic Shiva of the Varubur temple. The Valampuram temple contains an unusual bronze of Shiva as hunter, a form he assumed in order to test and challenge Arjuna, hero of the Mahabharata epic. Hunter Shiva is a refined figure, bearded and mustached, with hands poised to hold the now missing bow and arrow. An ornamental chain crosses and encloses his torso above his short dhoti, while his adornment consists of large rings in both ears, simple armlets, elbow bands, bracelets, and anklets. His accompanying consort is an enchanting image with curls framing her face and hair arranged at the rear in an elaborate chignon. A quick look at two other female images that are closely similar in the modeling of the body, in the details of adornment, in the elegant knotted chignon. Far right, an image of Paravai, wife of Saint Sundara. At the center, an image identified as a queen. A little telltale detail of the drapery of this period is the manner in which the narrow ribbon-like folds of the skirt run along the inner side of both thighs to form an upper loop and two lower stylized strips. And all three belong to roughly 1150. Their rear view shows further similarities, including but by no means restricted to the hairdo. The masterwork at Valampuram is this bronze of coppery hue with a mirror hanging behind it. And to the left is the now dry temple tank from which the bronze was recovered. I ignored the shiny image when I first walked into the temple, assuming it to be a modern piece. I then did a double take as I realized it was the very bronze I had traveled such a distance to see. Clearly the temple authorities had cleaned it they had used the local olive of the palm tree, the soapy olive that suds up if soaked in water for a short time, the palm olive of Colgate palm olive fame. The donor's inscription describes this bronze dedicated in the year 1178 as Lord who walked with swaying gait. An unusual phrase. Where did this phrase come from? The answer was found in a hymn of Saint Appar, dedicated to this Valampuram temple, in which the saint used this precise phrase to describe Shiva as begging Lord. We encountered this form last week at Tirumangadu. Shiva in the form of a naked beggar who walked from house to house seeking alms, only to capture the hearts of the women who came to fill his alms bowl with food. But here there is a difference. Upper's poem describes Shiva as a silk-clad mendicant, the Lord who walked with swaying gait. The donor who commissioned this image must have told the wax modeler to create an image based on this specific poem of Upper. It's exceedingly rare to find a direct correlation between a poem and a bronze, but I do believe we have it in this instance. Here is the relevant verse from Upper's hymn that's placed in the lips of a woman who came to give Shiva arms. Clad in silk, fresh sandal paste upon his form of coral hue, heel to toe he placed his feet in dancing steps. I asked, 
My lord, which town is yours? The piercing eyes that gazed cast a spell upon me. As if to go elsewhere, he walked with swaying gait, spoke enchantingly. He came to Valampuram. Here he abides. Upper's lord, who walked with swaying gait and favored Valampuram, was immortalized in this bronze commissioned for Valampuram in the year 1178. Might you like to hear it in its original Tamil? Pattudutthu, pavalampol menial pashun shandam kondanindu, padam nova yuttuduttu inge nadamadi vandarku, yavvuri riyam perumani enre, vittedumar pola adu shaydu viraindu noki, veror padi poar pola, vattanaihal padanadandu, mayam peshi valampurame pukkange manninare. The bronze is an eloquent testimony to the assured stylistic confidence we saw last week in the earlier creations of the Thiruvangadi workshop. While that Thiruvangadi master created his works roughly 150 years earlier, it's clear that his descendants continued to produce work that maintained the reputation of the workshop, both for expertise in wax modeling and technical perfection in metal casting. In this coastal workshop at Thiruvangadu, an exceptionally high standard was maintained from around the year 1000 to as late as 1180. The average 12th century worshiper, in awe of the formidable aspect of Shiva that was evident in the heroic bronzes, needed a more loving and approachable counterpart. And this we find in the increasing popularity of the concept of the sacred fortress of love, in which goddess Uma plays a key role. This emphasis on the goddess manifested itself in two parallel streams. New constructions, like the royal temple at Darasaram, built a separate, self-contained temple to Uma with its own enclosing courtyard and entrance gateway to stand right beside the Shiva temple. And this aerial view helps to understand the alignment. Although of slightly smaller proportions, the goddess temple is monumental in its own right. All well and good, you might say, but how did the many smaller pre-existing temples already built across Chola territory, handle this concept of a sacred love fortress. Well, they focused on Uma as consort of the bedroom chamber, and constructed such a bedroom within each temple. You see it to this day adjoining the Shiva shrine, and here an identifying Tamil label painted above it, Tirupalliarai, sacred bedroom. Within this bedroom, a canopied throne bed carries a bronze seated image of the consort of the bedroom chamber. And inscriptions that dedicate bronzes of the consort of the bedroom chamber appear with increasing frequency during the 12th century. It's at the bedroom chamber that temple's early morning service is conducted by priests who perform a sacred awakening of Shiva and Uma the final late night puja concludes at the bedroom chamber, after which the temple doors close for the night. A 13th century ritual text that devotes one chapter to this late night service tells us that Shiva's footprints in bronze or silver should be placed on a tray and carried in a palanquin with ceremonial pomp to the bedroom chamber. It's customary in this part of the world to speak of God making man in his own image. In Tamil Nadu, as I remarked at our very first meeting, one might invert this equation and say that man made God in his own image. And I speak without the slightest hint of disrespect, but more with a sense of wonder at the phenomenon. In conclusion, let's turn to the temple priests who are the custodians of the bronzes, also the formulaic enforcers and protectors of all temple gifts. 
Each and every gift inscribed on a temple, whether it be for land, a bronze image, jewelry to adorn a bronze, a perpetual lamp, it ends with the phrase, in the protection of the Shiva priests, Pan Maheshwara Rakshay. Can I transport you to the year 1158? And will you imagine that this is a young Brahmin of 1158? who has recently succeeded his father as the chief priest of the local temple. He smears himself with Shiva's holy ashes, dons his simple necklace of Rudraksha beads, pulls his hair back into a knot. He doubles up the ends of his long dhoti and tucks it loosely around his waist. Checking that his tray holds the oil lamp, incense holder, bell, water vessel, he sets out to walk to the temple. He is grateful that he will not have to deal with the many disputes that had erupted over the past 10 years on the exact manner of conducting the annual great festival. Today, there is a definitive document written on palm leaf that lays out authoritative guidelines. The ritual text titled Procedures for the Great Festival was written by a respected Brahmin teacher in the year 1157 during the reign of Raja Raja II, with whose dramatic images we have spent much time today. Recently published in English translation, it addresses the chief priest who conducts the annual major nine-day festival in a Shiva temple. The principal icon for this celebration is a threesome seated bronze group of Shiva and Uma with their infant son Skanda between them, known by the term Soma Skanda. Once this bronze group is fully adorned, the festival procession commences. Each day and each night of the festival, the bronze group is paraded on a different vehicle. For instance, on the fourth night, they ride the bull. On the fifth night, a vehicle that depicts multi-headed, multi-armed demon Ravana, who attempted to shake Mount Kailasa, the Himalayan home of Shiva and Uma. On the sixth night, the group rides an elephant. On the eighth night, they ride a horse. The vehicles you see here are not of Chola date. They are silver-plated wooden images dedicated during the 18th century, but they serve to give you an idea of the grandeur of the vehicles. During this nine-day festival, special days are set aside to celebrate other major forms of the deity, forms that we have already examined for their artistic excellence. For instance, dancing Shiva and his consort are to be worshiped on the eighth night when their bronzes are taken in procession around the temple, not like this, fully adorned, and placed in the assembly hall to, the text tells us, spend the rest of the night watching the entertainments. The entertainments? Yes. The music, the dance, the drama that are part of such festivals and which draw vast numbers of devotees to the temple overnight. On the final ninth day, the concluding ceremony consists of a series of ritual baths to remove the pollution that the bronzes, that the deities, have encountered in the streets of the town. That bath occurs in a pavilion constructed for the purpose near a chosen water source. The very last bath is reserved for Shiva's ritual weapon, the trident, and for this, the priest must enter the water himself, holding the trident. A final word on the temple priests. In Tamil Nadu, priests lived a married life, occupying individual houses just beyond the outer walls of temples. Celibacy was not a recommended model. In fact, at the famous Shidambaram temple, only married priests were qualified to conduct temple ritual and this remains the rule to this day. As an explanation, let me end today with a verse from a hymn of Saint Upper, a hymn titled, We May Lead a Good Life on Earth. 
Upper quotes the example of Lord Shiva, who is always accompanied by his consort, Uma. This is how it reads. Do not scorn the joys and delights of life. They are not hostile to a life beyond. Look at our Lord, ascetic of ascetics, who dwells in our midst with his spouse of wondrous virtues, goodness, grace, and charm. Thank you. <laughs>